Hey fifth graders, it's Mrs. Van and Rudy is right here. You can see the black thing back here on the couch. He's going to listen to our story today. Today we're going to read the third and fourth chapters of our book, Guest. Um, if you haven't listened to the first two chapters, I would suggest you do that first and we're going to get started with our reading today. Dado didn't come home that morning, nor the next nor the one after that. A week passed without news of him. Finally, one of the local men told ma'am that Dado had gone to a distant village and found a job there as a farm laborer. He wouldn't return until the changeling was gone. In one way or another, he said. Even though it was my fault that Dado had left, I was angry with him for abandoning mom and me. Without Dado's wages, we had little to spend on flour and sugar. Ma'am grew too weak to do anything except care for the changeling, so I cooked and made sure ma'am ate. But it seemed like the changeling was sucking the life out of her. While I milked the cow, weeded the garden, scrubbed the floor and scoured pots, I wished the changeling would sicken and die. If I'd had the courage, I myself would have taken him to the crossroads while ma'am slept. As the changeling's belly grew round, he cried less but still far more than a human baby. When he was angry or hungry, he bit and kicked and pulled at Mam's hair. No matter how badly he behaved, Mam spoke softly and kindly to him. She rocked him and nursed him and gave him a name, Guest, for that's what he was. A guest in our home who'd return to his people one day as Thomas would return to us. Guest never smiled or laughed. He didn't gurgle or coo. When he wasn't crying, he lay in his cradle and scowled. Often he stared as cats do at something only he could see. I hoped it was the kind folk he saw coming and going in the, in the cottage to make sure ma'am treated their baby well. Surely they'd be pleased by his health. Someday soon they'd come with Thomas and trade him for guest. Dado would return and ma'am would recover and all would be as before. A year passed summer and fall and winter and spring. And still the kind folk did not come. Guest outgrew the cradle, but he did not stand or walk. Not one word did he speak. Even though he'd grown a few tiny yellow teeth, he wanted only milk. One morning as I stood at the garden gate with Guest in my arms, I pointed to the fields, I pointed across to the green fields to Merkwood and said, that's where your true people are, but they don't want you. Nobody wants you, not even ma'am. Certainly not me. You're a wicked, soulless creature, and I long to be rid of you forever. It was wrong to say such things to Guest, but what did it matter? He understood nothing, I said. He was more animal than human. A mongrel dog, maybe. The runt of a litter who should have drowned at birth. Guest's yellow eyes gleamed, but what lay in the shadows behind them... I couldn't guess. Most likely he hated me as much as I hated him. Turning his head, he gazed across the fields to Merkwood, a blue shadow in the distance, and made a series of strange, harsh sounds. Listen to you, I said, click, clack, click, clack. Is that all you can say? A beast is what you are. I felt a powerful urge to throttle him, to dash out his brains, if he had any, to drown him in the water trough to leave him at the crossroads. Granny was wrong. No matter how we treated the changeling, the kind ones would not bring Thomas back to us. The sound of harness bells interrupted my thoughts. I leaned over the gate and watched the peddler's horse come down the lane, pulling a cart heaped with all sorts of things that you never knew you needed until you saw them. And then you couldn't forget them. Shiny new pots and pans, bolts of bright cloth, Shoes and boots and hats, saws, hammers, barrels of nails, sacks of sugar, and smaller things like feathers, buttons, ribbons of all colors, spools of thread, combs, and pretty beads that sparkled in the sunlight. The peddler sat on his high seat behind the horse and waved when he saw me. He'd known me since I was a baby and ma'am and dad long before that. If he had a name other than peddler, we'd never known it. But he came every month or so, and he knew the name of everyone in the village and on the farms. 
He wore the same old blue coat, long and faded and patched here and there with bits of cloth that didn't match. On his head was a shapeless yellow hat with a crow's feather stuck in its band. A nose the size and shape of a carrot, but more red than orange, jutted from his face, and a bushy gray beard and drooping mustache hit his mouth. Halting at our gate, the old man smiled down at me. Here's pretty Molly Cloverall, who needs silk ribbons for her hair and perhaps a string of green beads to match her eyes or maybe even a bouquet of flowers to give her ma'am. Gas leaned toward the peddler and sniffed as if puzzled by his smell. I couldn't tell if he liked the smell or not, but it was the most interest Guest had shown in anything except milk. The peddler laughed. My, my, but you've got an ugly wee brother there sniffing me more like a pup than a babby. I scowled at the insult. Surely the peddler could see Guest was no relation to me. He's not my brother. Well, now, if he's not your brother, who is he? Unwilling to admit what Guest was, I said, a band of travelers left him in our garden. The peddler scrutinized Guest, leaning so close, I thought he might sniff the changeling like a dog himself. He don't look like a traveler's babby. Perhaps that's why they left him here. I, I was getting annoyed with the peddler's comments. He's so ugly and mean and nasty. They didn't want him, and neither do I. Guest turned his yellow eyes to me as he'd done before, and the old man said, I believe he likes you more than you like him. He doesn't like anyone, and what's it to you anyway? In a huff, I walked into the cottage without looking back. The peddler called after me. Does this mean you won't be needing ribbons or beads or flowers? My answer was to slam the door behind me. Dumping guest in the cradle, I ran to the window and peeked out. All I saw of the peddler was his back as he drove away. I wanted the ribbons and the beads and the bouquet for ma'am, but the peddler was entirely too nosy him and his feather and his cap and his sly eyes. And truth to tell, ma'am had no coins to spare on frippery. Well, that afternoon, Granny Hedgepath came by. Before she crossed the threshold, I'd hid in the loft. I didn't want to see her or hear what she might say to me, but I did want to eavesdrop on what she said to ma'am. I lay flat on the floor and pressed my ear to a knot hole. I brought more of my elixir to strengthen you, Granny said. Is it helping you, Agnes? All that will help me, ma'am said, is to hold Thomas in my arms again. Granny mumbled something, and ma'am said, See how this one has grown? Have I not been good to him? Have I not been kind? You've been more than good and more than kind, Granny told her. Then tell me, why don't they come for him? My milk has put fat on his bones and taken it from my bones. He rarely cries now. He sleeps at night and wakes at dawn but he doesn't walk or talk or even stand up like a proper young one. Why should they want him when they have yours? But you said if I treated him well, I said perhaps, Agnes Cloverall, perhaps they'd take this one back and return yours. Guest began to wail so loudly that I covered my ears. Perhaps, ma'am hissed. I've devoted myself to this creature for over a year. I've lost my husband and my strength, and you tell me perhaps? I said perhaps from the start, and I still say it. We don't know what the kind folk will do. There's no understanding them. They're not like us. If that's all the comfort you can give me, you might as well leave me to suffer. There was a brief silence. Then Granny said, so be it, Agnes. Truly, I have done all I can, but I urge you to go on caring for the changeling. You never know what might happen. There's still hope. I am weary of waiting and hoping. Just go and leave me be. I stayed where I was, thinking she might not want me to see her crying. Good day to you then, the door closed and man began to sob. Afternoon sunlight slanted through the loft's small window, bringing with it the smell of hay, the sound of birdsong, and the heat of summer. I watched bits of dust dance in the shaft of light and thought about Mam's longing to have Thomas back. What if, what if, what if I took Guest away and went in search of Thomas? Suppose I found the kind folk and persuaded them to take Guest and give me Thomas. Surely they'd see Mam had treated Guest well. Wasn't it possible they had some kindness in their hearts? But 
how was I to find the kind ones? They might be across the sea and far away. Then again, they might be just over the next hill. Those ones traveled here and there in the dark lands, sometimes staying in one place, sometimes in another. The villagers said the kind folk did not want to be found, but had anyone ever been brave enough to seek them? Perhaps in old tales, there were those who did, but not in our ordinary life, certainly not girls like me. Truth to tell, it scared me to think of going off on my own. I'd never been further from home than Lower Hexham, just a mile down the road, on the other side of the village was Mirkwood, where even the bravest voice dared not go. And beyond Mirkwood were the dark lands. If it hadn't been for me, my brother would be in Mam's arms and Dado would be smoking his pipe in the garden. And the changeling would be, well, wherever he should be, not here. So no matter how scared I was, I had to make things right. Me, Molly Cloverall, all by myself. I would rescue my baby brother. I found a ma'am downstairs nursing guest. Too sad and weary to turn her head, she didn't notice me, but the changeling gazed at me with yellow eyes, as watchful as a cat. Soon you'll be gone, I mouthed at him, you hateful thing. He closed his eyes and gave all his attention to ma'am and the milk he sucked from her. I'll fix supper, ma'am, I said. Is there anything you'd like to eat? Still without really seeing me, she shook her head. I haven't got much appetite. After she'd eaten a bit of bread and half a bowl of soup, she lay down on her bed. For once, Guest was sleeping, and I was glad to see Ma'am using that time to rest. After supper, I pumped a pail of water from the well and washed the dishes, and when the kitchen was clean and tidy, I went outside and stood by the gate. Across the fields, Mirkwood lay deep in shadow. Birds chirped in the hedgerows, and tall stalks of purple foxglove swayed gently, still humming with the last of the day's bees. The moon had already risen, pale-faced in the sky, almost full. The smell of wet grass sweetened the air. And in the distance, farm workers trudged home, their voices and laughter barely audible. Dado should have been with them, but he was far away working in unknown fields with strangers. Gripping the gate with both hands, I wished on the first star of the night. Please let me find the kind folk. Please let them take guests and return Thomas. Please let me bring him safely home. Please let Dado return and ma'am laugh and be happy. Please, oh please, a thousand times, please. Let everything be the same as it was. Chapter four. Well, the next morning, ma'am carried guest outside and laid him on Thomas's quilt. And for once, he lay still and watched the clouds float by in the shape of endless flocks of fluffy sheep. Crouching behind a bush, I spied on Guest while I weeded the garden. I was sure he didn't know I was nearby. Perhaps if I waited long enough, Guest might, just might, reveal something. Surely he had secrets. Maybe he knew where the kind folk were. Maybe they talked to him and he to them. A fly landed on my nose and I brushed it away before it made me sneeze. Ants paraded across my foot, tickling my toes. Beads of sweat trickled down my back and the sun was hot and the air heavy with summer. Bees buzzed in the foxgloves as if they were trying to lull me to sleep. Guest began, began wailing softly, not a cry, not a shriek, but a sad sound that rose and fell. Not quite sobs, not quite a tune. The song drifted across the garden and over the wall. It mingled with the breeze and the rustle of leaves. It ran with the stream over rocks. It mingled with the singing of birds and the humming of bees. Sorrowful it was and beautiful. I never heard anything quite like it. Certainly not from Guest. The song ended as suddenly as it began and Guest turned his head toward my hiding place. His yellow eyes found me and held me fast. Silent now and sly. He looked at me as if daring me to come closer. I got to my feet and stared down at him. Where'd you get, learn that song? He kept his gaze on me. His expression didn't change, nor did he answer. Not that I'd expected him to. I might as well ask the cat. I leaned over him, my face mere inches from him. I don't know what you see when you look at me like that. Do you know what I see when I look at you? His face became secretive. I see an ugly, ill-natured creature. I spat out the words as if they were poison. An imp from the devil. 
as ugly as Thomas was beautiful, as nasty as Thomas was sweet. A magpie in the hedgerow cocked its head at me. Its wings stirred as if the bird was ready to fly away to the kind folk. No, I must not speak harshly to Guest or harm him in any way. Not while Thomas was a prisoner of the kind folk. Ma'am came to the door and looked out. Is everything all right, she asked, meaning was Guest safe? Everything is fine, I lied. At the sound of Ma'am's voice, Guest began to shriek. He kicked and waved his fists. Bending over him, Ma'am picked him up with difficulty as if he'd grown too heavy for her. Surely you're not hungry again? His answer was to strike her with his flailing fists and tear up open her dress. By that evening, Ma'am scarcely had the energy to eat her supper. Her eyes were nearly as sunken as Granny Hedge Pat's, and blue shadows discolored the skin under them. Her hair, once thick and shiny, hung limp in uncombed strings around her pale face, and her dress hung on her thin body. Later that night, I wrote Ma'am a letter. I have taken guest and gone to find Thomas. Do not worry. I will be safe and I will bring Thomas home and leave guest with them that he belongs to. Please eat and rest whilst I am gone and get strong. Love from your daughter, Molly. Quietly, I filled a canvas bag with a loaf of bread, a jug of milk, and one of water, a hunk of yellow cheese, and six apples. I didn't dare take more because we didn't have much. I touched the locket hidden under my dress. Perhaps I could use it to barter with the kind folk. Like magpies and crows, they probably like shiny things. I tiptoed to the cradle. Guest lay still, but his eyes were open, shining like a cat's in the dark. Expecting a struggle that, struggle that would wake ma'am, I wrapped him tight in a blanket that I slung on my back, and without so much as a whimper, he let me carry him from the cottage. The dirt road was white in the moonlight, and the foxgloves that bordered it were black. Everything else dissolved in shades of gray. The fields quilting the hillsides, the stone walls, the grass. The only sound was the cry of an owl somewhere up ahead. At the top of Cattail Hill, I turned and looked back at our cottage, so small at the foot of the hill. It, I'd never spent a night away from ma'am. Now here I was about to set out on a journey with no clear idea of where I was going or when I'd be back or if I'd be back. But on I trudged downhill and into the village the moon silvered its thatched roofs. Windows were dark. Not a single candle shone. I felt like a burglar, creeping from cottage to cottage, choosing which one to enter and rob. A dog barked on a narrow side street, and a cat peered down at me from a high stone wall, eyes agleam. In one house, someone snored loudly enough for me to hear. I paused to shift guest to a better position. He'd still not made a sound, but he tightened his grip and dug his fingernails into my shoulder. This close, I smelled his wildness and quickened my steps. The sooner I found the kind folk, the sooner I'd be rid of the creature on my back. As we neared the old stone bridge that spanned the river, I saw a horse and cart stopped in the middle. The peddler leaned against the wall and played a penny whistle. On my back, Guest shifted his position to look over, his, over my shoulder. When the peddler saw me, he smiled, but instead of greeting me, he continued to pay, play a melancholy tune. The music seemed familiar, but I didn't know where I'd heard it, only that I had. Guest dug his feet into my back and reared up to get a better view at the peddler. Lowering the whistle, the peddler said, Well, well, if it's not little Molly Cloverall with the traveler's babby on her back, what brings you out so late at night? Not to buy ribbons and beads and flowers, I wager. The creature won't sleep unless I walk him about in the moonlight. I was so surprised at how quickly the lie fell from my mouth. It soothes him. Ah, I've known a few babbies like that. He reached over my shoulder to pat Guest's head. Careful, I warned him. Sometimes he bites. The old man laughed. No fear. The meanest dog in the world knows better than to bite me. I took a step to pass the peddler, but he stopped me. If I were you, I wouldn't go any further. The crossroads lie just ahead and beyond them is Mirkwood, both dangerous places for a lass and a babby on a dark night like this. Oh, I won't go further than the bend in the road. I pointed ahead to a place where the road curved. You wouldn't be fibbing to me, would you? I crossed my fingers behind my back and shook my head. No, sir, that I would not. 
Take care as you go then. He stepped out of my way and doffed his yellow hat. It's black feather bobbed. May no harm come to either of you. With relief, I crossed the bridge and glanced back to see if the peddler watched me, but he'd already turned toward the village. His horse's hooves rang on the stone and the harness bells jingled. All too soon, the road curved and the village was behind me. No more than a huddle of cottages by the side of the road, now as small as heaps of stone left by children. Ahead, just over the hill, was Mirkwood. Hitching guest higher on my back, I climbed the road to the top. From there, I looked down on the dark forest. It stretched as far as I could see, bordered by the sea on the far side and the dark lands on the other. Again, Guest hoisted himself high enough to see over my head. He yelped like a fox or a wolf, a strange, incomprehensible sound. From the forest, an owl hooted, as if in answer. Going downhill, I picked up speed again until, stumbling on loose stones, I forced myself to go slower. It would not do to fall. At the bottom of the hill were the crossroads, dark with sorrow and foreboding. Those who killed themselves were buried in this place. Murderers, too, and thieves, all who weren't allowed to lie in churchyards. Changelings and unwanted babies both had been left here to die. If any place was haunted, the crossroads was. Moaning softly, Guest clung to me and rocked back and forth as if he feared I might leave him here. I wished I could do exactly that, but I was almost certain the kind folk would take him and give me Thomas. As soon as we left the crossroads behind, Guest loosened his grip and stopped moaning and rocking. Very still now, he crouched behind me as a frightened animal might. For the first time, I felt a twinge of pity, a very small one, for certainly Guest had caused a great deal of hardship to our family and did not deserve my sympathy. Catching light from the moon, white stones lined the path into the forest. After a few steps, darkness closed around me. I kept my eyes on the stones, afraid of what I might see if I looked between the trees on either side of me. Guest resumed moaning. He seemed to be as frightened as I was. Things moved in the shadows, too far from the path for me to see what they were. I hoped they stayed where they were. On my back, Guest moved restlessly and muttered to himself. His warm breath tickled my neck, and with every step I took, he seemed heavier, and my legs felt weaker. I longed to be rid of him. Too weary to go on, I eased Guest from my back and sank down to rest against the smooth side of a mossy rock. Guest huddled beside me, clicking and clacking to himself. Sometimes he glanced at me as if he expected me to understand him, but the noises didn't sound like words to me. If only you could tell me where to find the kind folk, I said, but you can't talk and you can't walk. What use are you for me or anyone? Guest hung his head and stared silently at the ground. For a moment, he reminded me of a lamb I'd once raised because its mother refused to nurse it. A useless runt, Daddo called it. He told me to let it die, but I nursed it with a rag soaked in milk, and it, when it was too big for me to carry, I let it go back to the flock. But Guest was not a lamb. He was a wicked creature, unwanted by his mother or anyone else. He didn't deserve my pity. I squatted beside him and looked, him into, and looked into his eyes. Do you know where we're going? Guest peered at me, wild and strange. I'm taking you back to your own people, the ones who didn't want you the ones who took my brother and left you in his place. The kind folk they're called, though they are not kind at all. I'll trade you for my brother and be rid of you forever. Guest made a mournful sound and curled into a small ball. Had he understood what I'd said? No, I told myself. He had no more intelligence than a dumb animal. I poked him as if he were a sleeping dog. Can I trust you to stay with me if I sleep? Guest curled up even smaller and covered his big ears with his hands. I poked him again, harder this time. You had better be here when I wake up. No answer, not even a look. If I'd had a rope, I'd have tied him to a tree. I covered him with the blanket I'd used for a sling and pulled another for myself from my canvas bag. I'd sleep for a while and then go on. Soon we'd find the kind folk. I was sure of it. Well, almost sure. When I opened my eyes, morning had come and Guest was gone. I leaped to my feet and gazed into the misty forest. The trees had kept their vigil. They still stood tall and straight. But where was the changeling? Guest, I called. Guest, where are you? My voice bounced from one tree trunk to the next, but I heard no answer. I called again and again, peering into the mist, but afraid to leave the path. A few days ago, I'd have been happy. 
guest was gone. But without him, I had nothing to trade for Thomas. I might as well go home. I opened my bag and pulled out the water jug. Before I'd taken my first sip, I saw a guest. He bur burrowed into the ferns like a fawn and almost buried himself in a hollow under a boulder. His back was to me and he seemed sound asleep. Angry at the trick he played, I shouted, Wake up! He turned and looked at me, blank-faced as usual, and crawled slowly from his hiding place. The first thing he did was grab the milk jug from the bag. I yanked the jug away from him, removed the top, and held him while he drank. Such a greedy creature he was. Guzzle, guzzle, guzzle. You can't drink at all, I told him. I doubt we'll find a cow in Mirkwood. He shrieked and screamed and flailed about just as he did at home, biting and pinching and kicking. It took all my strength to swallow him in the blanket and hoist him onto my back. As I walked, I ate a small piece of cheese while guests screamed. Ahead of us, the ground rose steeply. Warm, damp air clung to me, and midges too tiny to see bit my face, my ears, and my neck. Guests continued to wail and snort and snuffle. He squirmed and twisted, throwing his weight from one side to the other. I didn't dare turn and look at him, for fear I'd throw him into the ravine that bordered the path. On we went, mile after weary mile. The farther I walked, the more the trees closed in around us. Very little daylight found its way through their leafy tops. Guest and I seemed to move through endless twilight with no idea of time. Morning, noon, evening, but not night, not yet. Sometimes I walked between boulders that towered over us, their surfaces softened by thick coats of moss. Trees grew from the tops of some. Their roots twisted down the sides, digging into crevices. Water dripped from the rocks and pooled on the path. I wished I'd thought to bring a walking stick to keep my balance. At the top of yet another hill, I felt Guest's body tense. His grip on my shoulders tightened. Very softly, he began to make a series of clacking noises. At the bottom of the hill, a man leaned against a boulder, watching us make our way toward him. While he waited, he played a mournful tune on a tin whistle. The music put me in mind of the song Guest had sung in the garden. From where I could... From what I could see of the man, half hidden as he was in the tall ferns, he seemed a harmless sort, a wandering musician perhaps. I'd seen his light playing tunes on market day, a cat behind, beside him to catch coins tossed by generous folk. Keeping my eyes on my feet, I made my way slowly and carefully down the treacherous path. It was my hope that the man might know the whereabouts of the kind folk. Perhaps he would lead me to them. A bit of company would be a pleasure, especially if he was willing to carry guest for at least part of the way. Well, now I'm intrigued. So we'll have to wait until next time to read chapters five and six. I hope you're enjoying our book, Guest by Mary Downing Hahn. And I miss you guys, my fifth graders, Rudy, right here, the dark shape over here, Rude. Rudy, no, there, he poked his head up. Say hi to our friends. He misses you guys, and so do I. We hope you're doing well, and we look forward to reading the next few chapters of Guest with you. Have a great one, guys.